Hey guys, it's AK Rex. I'm back again, and today I bring back our special guest from the part one, Doctor and Professor uh, Philip Curry, and helping me out today as usual. <laughs> well, usual now is going to be probably for this channel. Joshua will say, "Welcome everybody." Hi, Josh. Uh, Hi, Doctor Philip. Hi guys. How's it Hello. going? <laughs> Awesome, awesome. So, I uh, uh, think uh, since last time we had a very specific narrowed down uh, subject, so m mostly focusing on Mongolian dinosaurs. So, I uh, guess maybe uh, there are some, there's a, some, a very interesting question that I know that Josh really wanted to ask, so I will pass the mic over to him. Uh, it's uh, obviously he, you, he will say in more detail, but it's to do with paleo poaching. So, Josh, would you want to go ahead and take over this one? Yeah, sure. Uh, first off, um, uh, Dr. Curie, I'm glad we didn't scare you away and uh, <laughs> you were able to return. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I'm glad and, I didn't scare uh, you. <laughs> no, no, you did not. <laughs> so, uh, the first question we got, um, which we touched up a little bit on last session, uh, mainly when we were going over Dino Karis, was uh, the subject of paleo poaching and how much it's been just uh, ravaging the community in terms of the science, the finds, the loss of geological data. Um, and you shared this really cool story in the previous interview about how you had recovered some of the Dino Karis uh, remains and then you got a phone call and you found the rest of the remains that had been poached right down to fitting the pieces together exactly, which was an, a, like a mind-blowing story. Because uh, that's a rare happy ending that you hear to a lot of these poaching stories. So our questions are basically how bad is the poaching situation, particularly in Mongolia, because we've heard a lot of horror stories. And uh, what are your thoughts on poaching? Um, are, is there a way to stem it? Is there um, active ways to try to help people uh uh, to keep from poaching or or save the fossils like what, what can we do or what is being done i guess are my questions yeah i think it's a uh, it's very much a matter of uh, education in part uh to get the people in mongolia to stop poaching but they're not the only ones who are doing it there are people coming in from outside and uh basically putting crews together to excavate fossils and ship them illegally out of the country and then there's also been people and we know of this uh, who have gone in with bags of money, essentially, and given the money to go out and find out whatever they can and uh, bring it back and uh, then smuggle it out of the country. So uh, how bad is it? It's it's so bad that um, in places like Namagd, uh, you can't walk around without seeing a poach quarry, I'd say, at least once every half hour or more. Um, they're all over the place. And... Um, the most discouraging aspect of it is that um, it's uh, there's different levels of professionalism, we'll say, in terms of how the specimens are collected. But the most common poach quarries we see are the ones where the bones are just destroyed. They're not even taken. Uh, essentially, what they'll do is, is they'll find some bones sticking out of the hillside. They'll take a pickaxe or a jackhammer or, uh, in one case, dynamite even. And... Um, uh, hack it out of the hill and uh, um, we've seen skeletons where they found one end of the skeleton and uh, basically just took a pickaxe and went right through a whole vertebral column trying to find the skull and uh, um, so the wanton destruction is absolutely staggering um, and uh, it's, uh, of course, the most saleable things are things like teeth and claws and so in some cases uh, they don't even care about a skull. They'll just destroy it as well to get the teeth. Um, there is just so much poaching going on that uh, um, at its worst, which I'd say was probably peaking around 2010, uh, you know, you just saw a broken bone everywhere. It was so discouraging that uh, you didn't feel like going back as a scientist, and certainly if you were a tourism there on an eco tour, uh, looking at uh, fossil resources of Mongolia, you got pretty discouraged as well. Um, so it wasn't uh, doing a lot of good for the country. 
The big problem in Mongolia is just that they have um, a very big area, big country that's very sparsely populated. And so it's very difficult for them to patrol these areas. And uh, it was so bad that I'd say about 15 years ago, we met uh, one person who was responsible for patrolling those areas, but he had no vehicle. And he lived, in fact, almost 100 kilometers away. So what can you do? <laughs> Without helicopter support or anything else, um, you're just not going to be able to uh, prevent this kind of thing from happening. But um, in terms of uh, education, uh, I think the Tarbosaurus skeleton that got sold in New York or attempted to be sold but then got confiscated by uh, Homeland Security and then sent back to Mongolia. That was a, a major step in terms of educating the people of Mongolia. Uh, in part, um, you know, they're aware of the dinosaur resources, but they're not uh, necessarily aware of how valuable those resources are to their own heritage. And as a consequence of that, um, the tendency is that if something's fairly common in your area, you tend to think it's like that everywhere and therefore it's not so important. Um, so the, uh, the whole uh, court case and um, uh, the decision to return the specimen to Mongolia and so on had a very big impact in Mongolia in terms of educating the people. And so now you have uh, people who are aware that this material is scientifically valuable and it's very valuable to their own national trust as well. And they're taking a certain amount of pride in that and uh, some of the people who don't care, some of the poachers, are actually being reported by people who do care. And in the long run, that's probably going to be a much more effective way of policing these things than having the police running around trying to do it, uh, because then you have a much bigger contingent of people out there. Uh, the police, though, have been also uh, uh, doing their part, and uh, uh, all the different levels, of, of course, and uh, many specimens have been seized at the border now and uh, do end up in the museums. But uh, the problem there is that uh, in most cases you have no idea where the specimens came from and uh, the specimens have also been damaged. Uh, so we have one beautiful slab, for example, that's in uh, Ulaanbaatar in the museum right now. Uh, which has parts of three articulated skeletons that are all curled up together. Uh, and this is an oviraptorosaur. Uh, but uh, it was obviously part of a much bigger site. And uh, only one of those three specimens is complete. The other two would have been continued in other blocks uh, that weren't confiscated. And we don't know where the specimen comes from anyway. Uh, we're gradually finding ways that we can... Um, figure out where these things came from uh, and uh, some pretty sophisticated technology at work there uh, but we're still uh, probably uh, a ways away from being able to do it positively and having enough basic data that we can uh, pin down our sites and uh, know that when we see a poached specimen it comes from that particular site. But uh, the combination, I think, of education and policing, and it certainly would be nice if people didn't buy these things, uh, because that creates the market, of course. But uh, um, realistically, I think it's going to continue for some time into the future. It's getting better. Uh, certainly the policing end of it in Mongolia is getting better. But uh, uh, nevertheless, we're still seeing it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's pretty insane. <laughs> Just mm -hmm. every level of it that I've been able to break down. And then um, uh, I I did not mishear you in terms of saying like you said they used dynamite. Like they were using explosives in some of these oh, cases. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because because that's a level of destruction I haven't heard since um, since the Bone Wars. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, Charles and Marsh were out there just kind of destroying specimens so the other guys wouldn't get them. I mean, that's that's the level of destruction that I can really compare it to in the field. So that that's yeah. just insane. Um, and then uh, it's interesting to note that when you said um, there's one guy policing a huge area, 
uh, I can relate to that because we work with a lot of the uh, the Native American tribes in Arizona. And one of the issues we run into are the petroglyph sites get either poached or they get shot at. And it's the same issue. It's one guy, he does have a car, uh, but even then with a car, he can't patrol this huge area of this yeah. national forest because there's just so much area. It's off road. Um, there's like uh, there's something called the Web of Power, which is three geological sites around the entire state, and they're separated by like 40 miles <laughs> on average. So it's just an insane amount of just like yeah, that I can uh, I can understand that completely. So so to clarify, the steps we can take are uh, if you're a tourist in Mongolia, don't contribute to the fossil sales. In, in other words, don't buy these fossils. Because that's what's generating the market, yeah. and then if you're not in Mongolia but you ha you are aware of Mongolian fossils being sold, uh, it's good to report those so that way those specimens can go back to the Mongolian government. And uh, uh, and then is there another step that I, that I missed in there that we could help? Well, just the public education of the people in Mongolia as well. And uh, we're certainly doing what we can with that. The Mongolian government is doing what they can with that as well. Um, and uh, fundamentally, the combination of the three things, I think, will, will eventually help clear this up. But, uh, I mean, it's quite bizarre because Mongolia actually has the oldest act known which protects fossil resources. Um, they started protecting dinosaurs back in 1924, and um, at that time, of course, the American Museum of Natural History was going in there. The uh, uh, Mongolians um, didn't want to see the material leaving the country. They, um, they did stop those expeditions, unfortunately, and then uh, uh, I'd say unfortunately because of the fact that um, if you're going to do something like that and protect fossil resources, it doesn't protect them unless you can also protect them from erosion. Um, so the, the reality is that uh, when you protect things one way, you have to make sure that they are still being collected um, by museums and to get into proper uh, places for storage and curation and so on. Uh, and unfortunately, that's, that didn't happen at that time. And in fact, uh, the Mongolians had forgotten about the fact that they passed that law <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> until, until uh, 2010 when, uh, uh, when this problem with the uh, Tarbosaurus being sold in New York for a million dollars uh, came up. And uh, then they dig, did some digging into their own acts and found out that, uh, well, yeah, we have been protecting these things for a long time. Um, but, uh, you know, legislation is, is a good thing, but uh, it's, it's a two-handed uh, sword or a, or a sword with uh, blades on front and back, and <laughs> you have to be careful how you use it. <laughs> and uh, uh, fundamentally, um, you know, you, by assuming protection of something and assuming responsibility for something, that means you have to do something with it. And... Uh, um, it just uh, is, is crazy that uh, it got so out of hand, uh, especially between the years 2000 and 2010. And there were so many excellent, scientifically important specimens that were destroyed um, by this, all of this activity. <laughs> Wow, that just blows me away. And then, uh, so, and then, just to clarify, it, it's not a um, a Grand Canyon type of situation where you can leave this uh, protected site to be, and it will stay preserved. You you actually do have to be in there actively preserving the special the specimens, collecting the specimens because they are being left out in the elements, and that is doing just as much destruction, if I'm hearing this correctly, as these people with pickaxes and dynamite just blowing things up and tearing it apart. <clears throat> no, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, the erosion rates, I, I don't know of any studies that have been done to say what they are, at, say, the flaming cliffs. But the rock is very soft, and we can go there every single year and we'll see new fossils exposed. Uh, so the key thing right now is to make sure that uh, all of this poaching stops um, so that we can have a handle on, uh, you know, where the specimens are coming from, what levels are coming from, how old the specimens are, uh, what specimens represent what in what sites, and so on. 
Um, so it's not uh, a hundred percent loss as long as it stops. Uh, yeah. Right now, it's a, like a ninety percent loss of scientific data. Um, it's it's quite tragic. Yeah, no, that breaks my heart, and it breaks it breaks both me and Arson's heart because, as you know, we did a lot of work in the Tyrannosaur chart, and again, this this one this one skin specimen right here. This mm -hmm. was a product, this was a victim of poaching, if I'm correct, right? Like, this was poached yeah. and was collected, or they had a, um, they had a molds of it made, but this actual physical piece was lost, right? No, that actual physical piece was in the quarry, and, uh, you know, this, this again gives you a, uh, an indication of the enormity of the problem. This is a site in uh, uh, central Mongolia called Bugin Sav. And uh, Bugin Sav was discovered in 1964 by the Mongolians. And uh, when they found it, they decided that it was such an important site that they would protect it. And so they, um, I forget how it was protected. It wasn't a park, but it was uh, some kind of status like a park where people couldn't actually collect there. And uh, for the people who saw that site, uh, they saw the most amazing thing because there were nine Tyrannosaur skeletons laid out on the ground uh, in a relatively limited area and uh, more skeletons of Sauralophus and other dinosaurs. And uh, these are dinosaurs that had been uh, partly eroded out so they were on the surface and you could see them. And uh, um, all was fine until the year 2000 and at that time I went to the site for the first time. And when I went there, all those nine specimens were gone. Um, People had come in uh, probably in 99, uh, but maybe even earlier in the year 2000 with pickaxes and they collected all of the Tarbosaurus skeletons and all of the Sauralophus skeletons. But they didn't do a professional job. I mean, you could tell what was everywhere because of the fact that um, they basically were just hacking things out. And so all of the skulls were gone, parts of the skeletons were gone, but uh, a lot of the skeletons were still in each quarry. So you could see exactly where the specimen was. And that included the Tarbosaurus skin. <laughs> and so one of the quarries was obviously a Tarbosaurus that had a lot of skin covering part of its body. And uh, sheets of that skin were sitting in the quarry. And uh, um, it's the... You know, we'd seen a little bit of poaching before that, uh, but that was the first time where, to me, I was just totally shocked by just how much damage had been done. In a protected site, nine Tarbosaurus skeletons plus several Sauralophus skeletons, just completely destroyed. And uh, to this day, we have no idea where those specimens are. Um, you know, they're, they're, I think, gradually turning up uh, as uh, different governments are seizing material. Uh, in some cases from private collections, so people should be careful about this, and uh, in terms of buying these specimens as well. Uh, but uh, uh, the scan impressions uh, just gives you an indication of how well articulated that particular specimen must have been uh, before these people got to it. Wow, yeah, no, nah, man, it, it, it just breaks the heart, uh, for me specifically, because things like poaching, because um, I've, I've experienced that kind of a loss in the field personally uh, with the Native American sites, yes. um, and um, it, it does. I mean, I have pictures of sites that are breathtaking that just aren't there anymore because things get bulldozed. Uh, one of the worst stories we heard was an entire village that got bulldozed by the person who inherited the land because he knew the land was going to get um, protection status from the historical government. Yeah. And because he didn't want to lose the mineral rights by preserving this entire village of, of um, Pueblo houses, uh, they just took a bulldozer. And the only thing that remained was like three walls of this village. We found those three walls. And then within the time of uh, five to six years while we were trying to get protective status of the site, uh, all of those walls came down. So there's absolutely nothing left of the village anymore. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it it, it um it definitely tugs at my heartstrings. Uh, but like you said, at least there's um there are um, means and steps that are being taken to stem the poaching epidemic uh, in Mongolia. Uh, that level of destruction just blows my mind. 
Um, I'm going to hand it off to Arson because I, I need a minute to recu- to recuperate uh, personally because <laughs> that's a lot of info for me to take. In, so. Yeah. Uh, it's it's, it's just it just blows my mind, man. So, but but thank you for answering, uh, Arson. Off to you while I go uh, hug myself in a corner really fast. <laughs> yeah, you you do that because I can't really reach out to help you out with this one, unfortunately, Josh. But uh, in any case, yeah, it's it, that's uh, just for the viewers as well. That's a really that's one of the worst things that can pretty much happen to a digging site for any paleontologists involved especially people or people who are trying to collect the data to because it's a valuable scientific information and uh, a lot of it just got butchered literally and uh, with no way obviously to now recover a lot of things because they just got destroyed into dust in some areas and in some cases it was just like all the most i presume all the most valuable assets were taken like the skulls and things like that which always hold a lot of value is that correct mm-hmm yeah, yeah the, uh, they, they like to take the showy things. Of course, so, naturally, yes. I mean, if... Skulls, and, hands, and feet. <laughs> yep. That, that's one of the most telling things. But, uh, well, okay. I mean, uh, that will give the viewers an understanding of how uh, things can get really painful sometimes on the field. And yes. uh, let's just hope that whatever, whenever the means to deal with the problem come out, uh, there will be, obviously, a lot less of these things happening. No. Yeah, well, I sincerely hope so. And the trend the last few years has certainly been towards improvement. It's not 100%. We're still seeing some destruction, but uh, overall, it's a lot better than it was, say, uh, eight years ago. As I said, 2010 seemed to be when it peaked. Yeah, sure. So, well, it's a lengthy process, I presume. Nothing happens overnight. So, yeah, wait not and at see. All. Well, all right, so let's uh, let's get into my my question then, since we are taking turns as usual. So, uh, do you believe uh, this is one of the questions I actually have as my personal for my personal research project? Uh, do you believe that the development of armor in herbivores could have had an influence over why certain predatory dinosaurs declined over time and eventually disappeared? while in turn Tyrannosaurids began, began evolving and then coincidentally they turned out that they were much better equipped to deal with the armored prey than say like Allosauroids and other similar theropods of similar periods. It's a, it's a good thought. I actually haven't uh, um, investigated that one too much, but uh, the bottom line is that um, you know, not all theropods would be equipped to take on, say, an ankylosaurus, unless it was a baby, of course, uh, because babies don't have too much of the way in the way of armor on them. But uh, the big de- animals, not only were they uh, heavily armored, but um, they were also built in such a way that it'd be almost impossible to turn them over. Um, you know, an ankylosaurid like Ankylosaurus or Euplocephalus. Those are animals that are much broader than they are high. So you're not going to be able to knock them over and uh, get at the soft belly parts. And uh, if you could do that, um, probably they would have developed uh, armor on the belly as well. Uh, Certainly some of the more primitive uh, animals had a tendency towards having armor on the belly. Uh, But uh, by the time you get up to ankylosaurids, they're just heavily armored and very broad, so they're very difficult to turn over. And then they've got those nasty tail clubs as well that they can do a little bit of damage, I'm sure. Um, but, uh, um, whether or not the appearance of ankylosaurs actually had an influence on the, the changeover that we see in the late Cretaceous from, uh, basically allosauroids to tyrannosauroids, um, that's an interesting one. And, uh, I think it certainly bears a lot more research. So I, I wish you luck on that one. Um, it's a, a matter of looking at a lot of different sites and data and the distributions of the animals. Um, I guess I kind of have a feeling, though, that tyrannosauroids took over because they actually were superior theropods or superior carnivores. And, uh, I mean, when you look at a tyrannosaur next to an allosauroid, it's an animal that has uh, uh, relatively longer legs. It was much faster than just about anything else at at that time. It's an animal that uh, uh, 
you know, in the case of once you look at the most sophisticated of them, the Tyrannosaurus rex being that uh, end of the scale, but um, even its ancestors in the Tyrannosauroidea uh, would probably show some uh, some of the same tendencies towards, say, binocular vision, um, being able to hear uh, what direction sounds came from, uh, being able to hear lower vibration sounds from the potential prey that you, you want to be chasing, uh, having those incredibly powerful jaws that uh, just have never been matched by any other animals, living or dead, and so on. I mean, these are incredibly sophisticated dinosaurs. And uh, um, so if uh, it may not have had... Uh, um, or it may have had rather the same effect uh, at their domination of the northern hemispheres uh, as the appearance of armor in things, in things like ankylosaurus. It's, it's just very difficult to know and tease those, uh, those two possible theories apart. And, uh, but I'm sure there's some way it can be done. Thank you for answering the question. I do have a few also like follow-up ideas to sort of elaborate a little bit, which I found really interesting in, uh, in terms of how basically, I mean, obviously when, it, when, it, when we talk about uh, how something like a Tyrannosaurid um, of the later Cretaceous period would deal with an armored uh, dinosaur like an Ankylosaurid, I mean, obviously, a lot of times maybe people misunderstand what I mean by that, by dealing, quote-unquote, with armor. Like, it doesn't mean that they have to just go to, through the toughest part of it and try to bite through it and expect to not have any problems doing it. Uh, it's more to do with being able, uh, you know, to find maybe the weakest spot of it, like maybe at the base of the skull or at the neck, and being able to bite down without any, you know, with the minimum damage to their own, uh, uh, maybe tooth system and be able to maybe like pin the prey or strangle it perhaps or do something else some other way of manipulating the prey basically which an allosauroid would not even go as far as that when as far as i can understand because of their way how their teeth and jaws are designed completely differently that's right. basically how i was thinking that uh, if you have predators that are basically evolved to do this kind of thing that means that they are a lot Li more likely to succeed in that period and in that environment than something that's just simply incapable of taking them. But then, of yeah. course, you have, like, hadrosaurs, which uh, would still be equally, quote-unquote, defenseless against whether it would be a large allosauroid or a tyrannosaurid. So it's just a mystery, I guess. So why would they not then be able to survive just by preying on hadrosaurids? But go figure so any any thoughts on that or is this basically as much a mystery to you as it is to anyone else here thinking about this question well i would say that uh, that that uh, whole scenario would argue against um allosauroids uh, basically disappearing because of lack of prey as opposed to competition with tyrannosauroids because uh, tyrannosauroids uh, would be more successful no matter what they were going after, whether it was a hadrosaur or an ankylosaur or a ceratopsian. And um, so my bet is that it's probably competitive exclusion, uh, which worked against the allosauroids in North America and Asia at least. Uh, but, um, you know, again, it's hard to prove. Um, <laughs> after all, allosauroids were the dominant large theropods for a long time and you would think that they would uh, uh, basically be superior in that niche uh, until they disappeared and once they disappeared then of course tyrannosauroids uh, which started off as small animals small theropods uh, they could have then uh, increased in size and filled that gap uh, that's the more common way things work but uh, not necessarily. I mean, uh, it may well be that uh, tyrannosauroids did develop in an area where there were few or no allosauroids. And that once they developed there, then, then of course they could expand their territories into places that had been dominated by allosauroids and do much better in those places. Fair enough. Yeah, of course, uh, one of the key problems and why I think probably it will be a lot of a uh, uh, an issue for me personally to find any good sort of you know resolution to answer the question or maybe settle for something it's just because of just how hard it is to find the evidence to 
actually, you know, actual empirical evidence to verify any of the potential questions and claims that are forming in a process, which is obviously why I'm always asking this question as I really want to delve deeper into subjects and perhaps produce a piece of work that would be an educative kind of piece of work, but something that it would be interesting to focus on specific subject rather just on an overall kind of idea. But thank you for answering anyway. It's uh, definitely going to come in handy when it happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Josh, would you like to take over and ask your question? Uh, yeah, I, I recovered enough uh, from uh, the poaching coverage that we did. <laughs> so, um, and then just to, just to kind of... Um, just to kind of touch up on the question you just answered. So again, um, this, these fictional theropods we're seeing in a, a very well-known movie that just came out a couple of years ago that we see flipping over an ankylosaur, that's probably not going to happen because like you said, its gravity is, is wider than it is taller. And even when you're trying to grip it around the lid, you got those spines like all over its shell, right? Exactly. <laughs> so... So yeah, I mean that's okay. Cool. I just wanted to throw that out there. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me see here. All right. Uh, I can do the Mapusaurus question. Is that, or is that one you want to do, Arson? Um, to be perfectly honest, uh, I don't really mind. I mean, you can literally just read out from it, and uh, if you want, because uh, it doesn't really change the nature of the question, regardless of who's asking. So I guess <laughs> you can okay, go ahead. Okay. Cool. Go I ahead. I just wanted to check with you real fast. Yeah. yeah go ahead. All go right. Ahead. So. Um, so, uh, the first part of the question is, uh, were you one of the participants, uh, mm -hmm. describing Mapusaurus, uh, Rosier? Oh yeah. Mapusaurus is an interesting story. Um, basically it starts with the discovery of Giganotosaurus in the, uh, 93 roughly it was. And, uh, around that time I got to know Rudolfo Coria and Rudolfo, uh, invited us to come down for the first time in 1995. And he, he, by then, Giganotosaurus had been just described. And uh, uh, he took me out to the quarry, and we talked about uh, uh, probably putting a project together at some point and uh, seeing what else we could collect in that local area. Uh, I would say that uh, anywhere from half to three quarters of the dinosaur species of the Cretaceous of South America, all of South America, come from a 100 kilometer radius of Plaza Winkle, where Rudolfo lives. So it's a pretty incredible area. So uh, we finally got uh, um, the expedition together in 1997, the first one. And uh, I went down uh, with my wife, Eva, and uh, I think we were the only Canadians that year. And uh, when we got down there, Rodolfo had uh, just had a report from a sheep herder of a dinosaur that wasn't too far away, and it was a theropod dinosaur. And he thought, well, this is ideal because uh, he works on theropods and I work on theropods, and it's the kind of dinosaur we like. And uh, <laughs> he took me out to the site, and sure enough, there was enough bones there to indicate that... Um, there was a skeleton in the hillside, and uh, we worked the next couple of weeks on that skeleton, uh, collecting the bones. It was kind of hard rock, unfortunately, but uh, nevertheless, the bones were interesting. And at the time, we thought it was probably just another specimen of Giganotosaurus. And uh, Giganotosaurus had been found not that far away, about 30 kilometers away, but in fact, it was in a different formation. And uh, so that should have made us suspicious right away. Uh, well, I get back to Alberta, and of course the summer season and winter season are reversed between the northern and southern hemispheres. And um, so I'd been down there in the late winter, early spring, came back to Alberta, and at that time we had just refound Barnum Brown's Albertosaurus site. Mm. And um, we realized that, of course, with the Albertosaurus site in Alberta, we had multiple individuals of a pack of carnivores in the same site. And while we were working in the Albertosaurus site, Rudolfo phones me and says, guess what? We've prepared those bones we collected in the spring from that animal that looks like Giganotosaurus, 
and there's more than one individual. Yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> there we were working in one bone bed of theropods and just discovering that one of the other sites we'd worked earlier in the year was also producing multiple individuals of theropods. So uh, the next winter we went down again, this time with a bigger crew, and uh, uh, opened up the quarry a lot bigger. We realized definitely we were dealing with a bone bed where we had uh, the mixed remains of multiple individuals in the same place. Um, unlike the Albertosaurus bone bed, which is 90% Albertosaurus and 10% other things, the bone bed in Argentina was 100% um, basically of this Cacaridonosaurus. The only indications we had of any other animal didn't appear until several years later when we realized that many of the bones had in fact been trampled by sauropods and that we had big sauropod footprints on top of the bones of this um, big animal that we thought was Giganotosaurus. Uh, to make a long story short, in the end we came up with at least the remains of nine different individuals uh, ranging in size probably from about three meters all the way up to 13 meters in body length. Um, we had, uh, uh, as I said, 100% representation of the carnivores, not, nothing else there except for the footprints. We had uh, uh, enough bones that we could put together the skull. Uh, so even though it wasn't one single individual, we had uh, all of the bones of the skull except the brain case, uh, which is a pretty important one for as far as I'm concerned. Um, but um, it uh, became very obvious that this was a not this was not the same as Giganotosaurus. Uh, Giganotosaurus, of course, has an incredibly long skull. It's it's uh, about two meters in length. And uh, this thing had a skull that was just as big. Uh, however, when you looked at the proportions of the skull, they were different because the face of Giganotosaurus is quite elongate uh, compared to, say, other theropods of that size. So if you compared a Giganotosaurus to a Tyrannosaurus rex, its face would probably be anywhere from 50 to 75 percent longer than the face of a Tyrannosaurus rex. Uh, in this new animal that we'd been collecting, though, the face looked uh, about the same proportions as what we would see in something like Allosaurus. And uh, there were a lot of other differences as well. Uh, we collected uh, some bones that were quite a bit bigger than the bones in Giganotosaurus. Um, I think that's just the luck of the draw, though, Giganotosaurus and this thing, Macrosaurus, as we called it in the end. They're animals of about the same size. They're animals that uh, are in adjacent formations. Um, one's a little bit older than the other, uh, but Maposaurus is in the same formation where we find Argentinosaurus, the really big sauropod. And uh, so it's no surprise when you've got uh, gigantic sauropods running around that you also have gigantic carnivores. And um, so we described uh, Maposaurus uh, in, I guess it was about 2006, and uh, um, it was a real fun project. Uh, there's still a lot more bone down there of this animal. We, we did not finish the bone bed. Uh, we only worked it for, I think it was five or six years, and uh, uh, if we wanted to extend that quarry, we could probably double the size without too much trouble. Uh, I should point out, too, that as far as we know, that's the biggest dinosaur quarry that's ever been dug in South America. <laughs> it was gigantic by the time we finished it. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, that's that's good news for people that are interested in South American theropods. And we, we now know that there is a bone bed that's actively still has a lot to offer, I guess. <laughs> exactly. So, like, all right, cool. You know, such big dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. So um, you mentioned that Mapusaurus and, and uh, Giganotosaurus are roughly, uh, one is older than the other. Yes. Um, okay, cool. Uh, the second part of this question is um, in, in reference to uh, anagenesis, uh, being uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Carr mentioned anagenesis in his 2017 abstract with uh, Displatosaurus horneri and Taurosis. 
Um, do you think there's something similar going with the Mapusaurus and a Giganotosaurus, or are they so separate that they're kind of their own thing more than they are uh, a, a product of anagenesis? You know, the, uh, the big problem, of course, uh, with looking at cladogenesis and anagenesis is always knowing the uh, complete picture of what's going on regionally. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't know in most cases whether there's slight climatic shifts uh, where you're, uh, in fact, dealing with a different fauna, uh, because faunas do move, and of course the seacoast was moving at the time, uh, in and out over North America, and uh, that puts the coastal environments in different positions at different times. It puts the uh, uh, what's very often called upland environments, although it doesn't necessarily mean uplands, uh, also <laughs> in different positions. So uh, sometimes it's very hard to tease apart what's going on with uh, um, cladogenesis, for example, versus uh, shifts in ecosystems uh, and versus uh, geographic invasions from, from, from other, other areas. And uh, so it's a very interesting problem. And uh, I would say that um, Thomas has certainly got things in his favor in Western North America in terms of the anagenesis story in the sense that we know very well what's going on with the different formations and they're all being very accurately dated these days and virtually everywhere we're looking we're seeing uh, transformations taking place over very short periods of time and it does seem that uh, not just the Spletosaurus but other dinosaurs as well uh, are going through uh, anagenetic transformations that I think are really, really cool. And uh, it's one of the, the most interesting problems um, in terms of uh, looking at big picture dinosaur things. Uh, <laughs> I think you can't though rule out the idea that uh, we are getting invasions as well from um, Asia as uh, the connections uh, either uh, connect or break between Asia and North America and North America and South America as well. And uh, so uh, exotic, closely related animals can move into an area too, and that could explain a few things. Uh, but uh, the fun of it is that uh, it's forcing paleontologists to take a closer and closer look at uh, the sites. It uh, requires a closer look and better dating techniques uh, for dealing with um, pinning down exactly what age they represent. Uh, it involves uh, paleobotanists and invertebrate paleontologists coming in and giving you their opinion on whether you're looking at a climatic shift or just a change over time. Um, it's uh, really forcing uh, a lot more multidisciplinary research uh, that very often involves people from multiple institutes and uh, this is all very, very good. Okay, so so <laughs> so the answer lies in the plants. So we, we need an Ellie Sattler uh, to reference Jurassic <laughs> Park to get in there and, exactly. get, and get more of the environment data, right? <laughs> yeah. Nice. Okay, cool. So all right. Um. So if I'm gonna break down your answer, it's the same issue that this bone bed needs to be um, excavated more, like not just in terms of the dinosaurs, but uh, the, the 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 botany, uh, the different fauna, the climate, these are the things that are missing uh, for a case of anagenesis or any other type of concept. Uh, is that correct? Well, it's not so much that it's missing. It, you know, we may already have all the answers we need on this, uh, but uh, whatever answer we come up with, whether it's anagenesis or cladogenesis, it doesn't matter. There's always going to be somebody and of course scientists are trained to do this, is skeptical about it, and uh, will come up with another idea. And that in itself is good because it forces people to, uh, well, they have to back up their claims and they have to do more research. And that more research means uh, having people of different expertise coming in and giving you their spin on it, um, and also uh, a lot more people and a lot more research being focused on a particular site or a particular region and the great thing we have in Western North America is uh, a lot of sites representing the same time slightly different geographic areas slightly different paleo environments 
And so this kind of research is being done in Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, all the way down into Wyoming and Texas. And, uh, um, you know, some of the things that are coming out right now are just so cool. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they sound really cool. And then uh, last part, uh, just to touch back up uh, to your answer, you said that it wasn't only Displatosaurus, but other animals that were, were kind of going through an anagenesis. Uh, do you have uh, more info on that? Oh, yeah. I mean, a, a good fun one, of course, is uh, when you look at Dinosaur Provincial Park in Canada, the, uh, it's one of the richest ecosystems anywhere in the world for dinosaurs. And uh, uh, go back to the old collecting days, the 1920s and before, and you'll see that a uh, tremendous number of dinosaurs came out, especially duckbill dinosaurs, and were given different names. So if we ignore Parasaurolophus for the moment and uh, the flat-headed duckbill dinosaurs, you had at one point 12 different species from Dinosaur Provincial Park. And I kind of defy you to find any locality in the world today where you have 12 species of large uh, very closely related uh, herbivores living in the same region. It didn't make any sense. So uh, Peter Dodson came along in the 1970s and he did this incredible study where he uh, looked at all of the duckbill dinosaurs from uh, Dinosaur Provincial Park and he measured them all and um, his idea was that uh, these don't represent 12 distinct species. These, in fact, represent a lot of variation within a much more limited number of species. And basically came up with three that we were looking at uh, males and females uh, and babies and adults of uh, Carithosaurus uh, cassuarius, Lambiosaurus uh, lambii, and Lambiosaurus magnacristata. And that was it. And to us in the 1970s, that made an awful lot of sense. Ecologically, it makes a lot more sense than having 12 species of these closely related animals in the same place at the same time. Um, but in the late 1990s, in <laughs> fact, uh, we did a major project in Dinosaur Provincial Park, and this was partly because the geologists had gone into the park and realized that we were dealing with not one formation in Dinosaur Park, we were dealing with two formations. Uh, an older formation that we call the Old Man Formation, that's a name that had been around for a long time, and a newer formation that we had just recognized called the Dinosaur Park Formation. And uh, so we have two time periods represented right there. And uh, that also gave us a datum though against which we could measure the uh, distance in time uh, from the transition from the old man period into the dinosaur park formation. And uh, so we took a differential GPS in and we went to all of the old quarries that we could find, uh, about 700 of them in fact, and uh, we figured out where they were in level. And uh, uh, this <laughs> had unexpected consequences because um, when we put the data on a chart, then we realized that um, specimens that had been identified by Peter Dodson as potential males of, say, Carithosaurus cassuarius were at a different level in the park than the ones that were identified as females. <laughs> and of course, that would be a perfect explanation for dinosaur extinction um, if the males were not found at the same time as the females, um, or more likely, uh, what Peter had done had been oversimplified and uh, that some of those species, in fact, uh, were valid species, not males and females. And uh, so now we recognize uh, five species of Lambiosaurines in Dinosaur Provincial Park uh, rather than the three that Peter had distilled it down to. Um, but we still have males and females and variation and so on, but um, still, still you have in Dinosaur Provincial Park uh, a very tight unit. It represents less than two million years of time, and in that uh, two million years we see transformations. Uh, we see, uh, you know, Lambiosaurus lambii. Uh, 
splitting into three different species over time. And uh, I mean, this is not very much time to do that in. Uh, these dinosaurs are changing very rapidly. And we're seeing the same thing with the Ceratopsians. So we can look at uh, transformation, for example, from uh, Coronasaurus into Centrosaurus apertus, uh, Centrosaurus apertus into Centrosaurus nasicornis, Centrosaurus nasicornis into Styracosaurus, <laughs> Styracosaurus into Pachyrhinosaurus. And each one of those animals has its own level within Dinosaur Provincial Park, and it's very, very consistent. And so we are looking at a transformation, and we're looking at evolution of these centrosaurine dinosaurs, and we're looking at the same thing going on in the lambiosaurine dinosaurs. Uh, again, it's not 100%. Is it anagenesis, or in fact, are we looking at successive invasions as the environments change? Um, we think it's anagenesis. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, it's it still has to be tested rigorously, not just by looking at the beds in Dinosaur Provincial Park, but by looking at the rest of the sites in Alberta and down in Montana. Cool. Yeah, no, that's that's cool. So like so we're looking at Hadrosaurs, Ceratopsians, I, I presume other uh, interesting individuals. And uh, yeah, and good, good so news. Well. <laughs> uh, which ones? And Kylosaurs. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. And Kyle is yeah, nice. showing the same kind of pattern right now, too. <laughs> oh, wow. So, yeah, I mean, that's the, and again, that's good news for the hadrosaurs that the females didn't die off two million years yeah. uh, prior. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, all righty. Uh, I'm going to back to you, Arson. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I was, uh, I thought maybe I should just let you guys have at it a bit more and just go and, I don't know, make tea, but uh, actually, uh, I changed my mind now. <laughs> In any case, a little bit of sidetracking here, but uh, yes, uh, there is um, another question here. Uh, this is something that I think would be very nice to discuss in terms of the relaxing sort of realm of a little bit of fantasy here, and uh, just uh, knowing how much you like to, uh, you know, look at a variety of different scenarios here, uh, Dr. Uh, or a Professor uh, Curie. I have this also personal research question. Um, this is actually for the project that I'm doing on my medieval fantasy novel. Uh, of course, you don't have to go through too much de depth to it. It's just a basic sort of understanding for fun's sake of it in terms of how plausible and probable this situation would develop. So uh, what I'm doing is right now I'm finding a bit challenging is that, of course, I'm, as I said, it's a medieval fantasy. So there's going to be people uh, living which are from like 15th century sort of uh, period, roughly of medieval time scale. But then uh, on the other hand, you they're living in a world where there are dinosaurs. Think of like late Cretaceous Hell Creek, maybe mixed a little bit with late Jurassic Morrison. So my question would be, uh, how do you, how well do you believe the humans of that particular sort of period would fare uh, in a, in an environment where dinosaurs are being the dominant species, and whether or not they would even survive long enough to be able to build castles and fortifications so they can ensure survival of their own species? <laughs> well, number one, I think there'd be a lot more castles. <laughs> <laughs> in place where you could hide. <laughs> but uh, aside from that, I, I, I think that actually humans would have done well. Um, you know, uh, the, the reality is that uh, you learn how to deal with the situation you're in. And uh, to us, it uh, seems pretty incredible that uh, humans can survive in, say, the African belt without uh, rifles and um, castles and <laughs> all those other things. Uh, because those predators are pretty ferocious. And of course, um, although uh, something like a Tyrannosaur would have been definitely uh, a much more nasty opponent to be dealing with, and, and one that would be much harder to keep away, there's still ways of doing it. And uh, whether it's uh, uh, the walls of a castle or uh, a, a moat or uh, uh, hiding in the center of an area that's surrounded by quicksand. I mean, who knows? Uh, there's always a way to do it. Uh, you can always find uh, um, uh, a way to get out of the way of the predators. Uh, the other thing you have to realize is that uh, something like a Tyrannosaur wouldn't necessarily be encountered all that often. I mean, uh, even a lion on the African veld, um, you're not going to see them every day. Uh, if you want to look for them, they're 
they're going to be out there and you are going to find them. Uh, but uh, for the average person living in that area, they don't see them every day. They don't see them all that often. Uh, the predators are greatly outnumbered by the herbivores, and uh, you can find your niche where you're out of their way, and they'll certainly try and stay out of your way too because you find ways you can hurt them, and they know that. Uh, with tyrannosaurs, tyrannosaurs were bigger predators. The chances are pretty good that they had a much bigger home range, and because of the fact that they had a much bigger home range, it also means that you would see them less often, even than modern mammalian predators. So um, would we be able to deal with it? I think we would. I don't think it'd be all that much problem um, compared to what early man had to do with the big game faunas that covered the world or even modern man deals with in uh, places like Africa. So in essence, I mean, it wouldn't really matter uh, whether we don't have like, of course, I mean, there was a certain degree of firearms developed in Europe. Uh, you know, in the 15th century already, but it just wasn't as reliable and mass-produced as basically later in the 16th century. But in this case, whether it's crossbows or bows or like a poleaxe or whatever else, a sword, uh, it won't really make much difference in that terms because of just the matter of... So where to... so basically the, the thing that I need to take into account here is that it's not just about whether how they would deal with each other when they come together, but it's more how they would, um, you know, whether they would actually get in, you know, together as often as I might probably imagine they would, and whether they would even be on each other's way, because there's always this chance that they might just not be interested. Would that be something worth considering yeah. too? Yeah, that uh, humans may be too small for them to be interested in. <laughs> not enough meat to be worth uh, trying to chase them. <laughs> And let's face it, I mean, uh, smaller animals are almost invariably much more maneuverable. Um, they're not necessarily faster, but they could be as fast. And uh, uh, like a, a good duck-billed dinosaur, probably you have your scouts out there and warn you when something's in the area that uh, you have to be aware of. Yes, that's a very interesting one as well, because uh, in the animal kingdom you have these sentries in the herds who always alert the herd, uh, you know. I mean, I can almost imagine sort of like a herd of triceratops or any other ceratopsian just grazing out there, just being completely relaxed. And then all of a sudden when they there's the, there was this um, idea that was frequently shown in the books uh, of uh, how if a pre once a predator approaches and sentry alerts them, they, they form like this kind of defensive testudo kind of thing uh, around their, you know, herd members and they just basically nothing basically gets past that wall uh, head on. So that's that's it, like Tyrannosaur misses its chance to do anything at that point because it can't separate the herd member anymore. So yeah. uh, I wonder if that's still popular uh, theory or is that kind of being abandoned slowly? Because obviously it's hard to test the empirically, but uh, is this something that we can potentially uh, expect to happen, uh, given that it could be quite an interesting and sophisticated way for a ceratopsian to deploy their assets, you know, to use it as an advantage against something like a Tyrannosaurus. Yeah, I would say that um, anything that animals use today in terms of defenses and so on uh, is highly likely to have existed in the past as well. Uh, it doesn't have to be muskox forming the circle with the heads facing outwards against wolves. Um, it's a kind of defense that, uh, you know, whether you're a fish, an insect, or anything else, um, the pattern develops over and over and over again in different parts of the animal kingdom and almost certainly at different stages in time, simply because it's a pattern that works. And uh, um, no matter how you, you think that these things evolve in terms of the behavior, uh, there's no question that it's it's got less to do with brain power than whether it works or not. So it's not just a mammalian thing. I think it's highly likely that uh, it would have happened in dinosaurs too. All right. Thank you very much for answering indeed. Okay. So All yes, right. I mean, that takes care of that part. And um, uh, Josh, I will uh, carry over to you now with your uh, next question, please. Okay, cool. So th this is a more rapid fire question. Uh, this question comes to us uh, from another uh, paleontologist uh, that we work with, Jeffrey. 
And uh, he wants to know, what, what's your take regarding Tarvasaurus and Tyrannosaurus as a co-generic uh, in terms of using the names to uh, re relate their relation versus the species, uh, like Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus or uh, Pteratophonius and Nanukasaurus? Yeah, well, I think Tyrannosaurs were pretty diverse, and um, the the idea that uh, Tyrannosaurus and Tarbosaurus are the same just isn't tenable for a number of reasons. Number one is if you um, you look at their distribution, uh, Tarbosaurus is an Asian form, Tyrannosaurus, of course, is a North American form, and uh, uh, does it make sense that uh, Tyrannosaurus is going to evolve from Tarbosaurus when there is another big Tyrannosaurus that's closely related to it here in North America called Displetosaurus? Um, personally, I don't think it makes any sense. Uh, but secondly, when you look at the anatomy of these animals, the one thing you see about Tarbosaurus that's very different than the other Tyrannosaurus is the fact that its uh, uh, limb length, its arms in particular, are incredible, incredible tiny uh, arms. And, uh, you know, of course, Tyrannosaurus rex is famous for its tiny arms as well, but Tarbosaurus has half the length of arms. And um, you just can't see that uh, um, in the case of Tarbosaurus, that an animal that had already taken evolution that much further than Tyrannosaurus in terms of reductions of limb length, the arm length, uh, would then uh, move to North America and lengthen its arms again. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, <laughs> I think there's a lot of other characters as well that um, we've been slow in terms of analyzing these things, but what we are going to find is that there are going to be a lot of differences between Tyrannosaurus and Tarbosaurus in the long run anatomically. The reason they look so much the same is because they're both gigantic Tyrannosaurs. And you have a number of trends in evolution uh, that are, in fact, changes um, in characters over time. And that's one thing you look at. But the other thing is that as you get bigger, bigger animals develop characters that are quite similar to each other. So uh, having the deep face, for example, uh, that you see in Tarbosaurus and Tyrannosaurus, well, uh, basically, you take any Tyrannosaurid and you make it the size of Tyrannosaurus rex. And what the growth tends, trends tell us is that they're going to end up with a very deep face and large, very powerfully built teeth, the way that either Tyrannosaurus or Tarbosaurus have. So the similarity then is... Uh, um, a little more complex than than just saying that these characters are the same in these animals. They're not. Um, they've come from the same place. They've developed the same way because of uh, growth to gigantic size. But it doesn't mean they're the same characters. And uh, when we do see unique characters, such as the shorter arms of Tarbosaurus, compared to any other Tyrannosaurid, uh, then you realize that it's going in its own way <laughs> And it is separate from what's going on in Displetosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, Albertosaurus, Gorgosaurus, or any of the other Tyrannosaurus. Um, and uh, again, uh, the more we look into this, the more characters we're going to see. Cool. <laughs> so yeah, that explains a lot for me. Uh, back to you, Arson. Uh, sure thing. Uh, and that was certainly a very interesting question. It shows how, it just proves one more time how uh, obviously, uh, paleontology is incredibly um, variable in the points of views and which ones uh, have their own defensible stances and how they kind of come together. Because obviously there are some who, uh, you know, have very, you know, opposite stances on it and they also have very good explanations for them. While uh, there are also those who don't support the idea and uh, they also have good explanations. And... Uh, uh, me, as somebody uh, here, uh, basically, ob I mean, of course, it's going to be one of those things that I uh, would be struggle to say, okay, so which one do I go with? What do I choose? You know, <laughs> but yeah, I guess, exactly. uh, but I guess it's uh, probably just worth to simply say how it is that for the viewers as well, guys, that uh, sometimes it's simply okay to not be able to make a choice because you simply don't have enough data to 
make the final decision on something and you just need to wait and be patient and find more fossils so and uh, now i'm going to go to the uh, next question after this uh, short comment and uh, i would i'm personally just really interested of course uh, I, I always see these people you know out there different you know uh, tv uh, stations you know uh, ch channels etc uh, they produce these documentaries uh, some of them are just quote-unquote documentaries, in my personal opinion. But uh, in your personal opinion, what sort of things uh, documentaries and uh, other educational bodies as well who try to teach people about dinosaurs uh, can use in order to better, you know, their techniques of education? How, do, how can they improve themselves and how do they, can they make it better to represent the factual evidence to the general audience and public? basically avoiding on one hand making it too confusing with the technical side which many people don't understand but on the other hand uh, giving them the right picture without uh, mixing things up of course if they always did it right then my channel would die because i would have no reason to rant but uh, uh, given how it is right now <laughs> there are plenty of reasons to do so and uh, i was wondering what your thoughts on the uh, actual uh, subject as well please thank you very much yeah, well, we've dealt with uh, hundreds of film crews over the years, of course, and uh, um, there's been good ones, there's been bad ones, there's been um, mediocre ones, there's been ones that uh, are mostly bad, but uh, almost invariably we find that almost every film crew has at least one good idea that, uh, um, you know, you would love to take the one good idea out of every film or every film crew and put it all into one package and get the perfect film. It'll never happen, but <laughs> the reality is that uh, there is the rights and the wrongs. Um, one of the best film crews we ever worked with was when we were doing the Canada China Dinosaur Project, and that spanned five years in in uh, uh, Alberta, the Arctic of Canada, and China. And during that time period, we had the same film crew with us. Uh, Maybe not for the whole field season every year, but at least part of the field season every year. So their goal was, in fact, to collect uh, film footage from every stage of the expeditions and then assemble a film at the end of it. And I think in the long run, they, as a film crew, not only had a better understanding of what we were involved with and what we were doing because of the fact that they were part of our crew, uh, but they also had a much greater representation of the whole spectrum of what's involved in uh, field expeditions and research. Uh, look at the opposite end of this scale, and uh, I would say the majority of film crews come in to visit our uh, quarries and so on on one day. And uh, in the one day, they want to see all stages of your operation, all stages of taking out a dinosaur. And of course, uh, the average dinosaur takes anywhere from three to six weeks to collect. Um, so the chances are you're not going to have all stages represented in one day or they're going to have to do it in different quarries or they're just going to have to gloss over the whole thing and uh, pretend that they saw the whole thing, which they didn't see. Uh, but more than that, uh, I think they also don't have a full understanding of what's involved because they're only seeing one level of the operation. Um, so that's uh, one argument I would make, is that uh, it's so much better when you have the luxury of having a uh, film crew with you for a much longer period of time so that they really become integrated with the whole system. And that's good for us too, because that ends up documenting um, all aspects of your own operations. You have somebody who's specifically there to do that. Uh, we work with a few other film crews that way as well, but uh, again, it's pretty rare. Um, I think in terms of uh, ideas, uh, film crews tend to come in with their own ideas about what they want to accomplish. And uh, it's a bit tricky sometimes because they come in with one idea and you're trying to um, get them to change their idea because it doesn't either fit with the uh, material that they're filming uh, or it doesn't agree with your own ideas about these things. Um, so we, we have seen uh, transformations during the course of filmmaking uh, where a film crew will come in and start with one uh, set of ideas about what they'll end up with and end up transforming into something else totally different. 
And, um, you know, this is good, the fact that they're willing to learn from it and everything, um, but uh, it would have been much easier if they'd uh, maybe done a little bit more research before they arrived and uh, knew exactly what they were dealing with and what they could and couldn't do. Um, there's, uh, uh, of course, a whole range of things that are done on film. Uh, you have uh, groups like the BBC, for example, uh, which when they come in, they have large film crews. They have people who are specialized in sound, people who are specialized in film, they have researchers, the directors, producers, and everything else. And uh, some people would say that that's excessive, but, uh, um, you know, there's no question that the product they get out is, on the whole, much more solid than when you have one person show up with a camera and he's doing the research, filming, sound, and everything else. And, uh, you know, depending on the person, of course, they can pull it off very well. Uh, they have no choice anyway. They've got to do it that way because whatever company has employed them, um, that's what their budget restrictions are. Uh, but uh, you still think that, uh, man, if they did uh, that and they had uh, you know, a little bit more research behind them, a little bit more uh, assistance, that they could do even a better job than what they end up doing in the long run anyway. So um, film crews are one of those things that I think paleo crews very often uh, spend a lot of time complaining about as well. And uh, uh, there have been... Many of us who've uh, talked to each other about uh, um, trying to produce content and then get the film crews, in fact, to pick up on the content. Uh, so the research has essentially been done and uh, they would basically put together a package or a story that we feel uh, tells a little bit about the science more accurately. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the way film crews work. Film crews um, develop their own ideas, then they raise their budgets for it, and then they have to go through to the end product. And uh, uh, asking the science scientists is very often the last thing that's done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, that pretty much, I guess, takes care of that one. <laughs> Certainly. I mean, uh, obviously, it's very interesting to know what... Um, sort of opinions and just general outlooks people have in the field about how these different filmmakers or documentary makers, uh, you know, approach, because sometimes they, like, come to you with certain questions, perhaps, that you are, like, that makes you think, oh, that's a good question, and then uh, sometimes it would be one of those, really? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> so, in any case, uh, uh, thanks for answering, and uh, let's pass microphone over uh, to uh, Josh. Hey, so um, I wanted to um, really fast uh, dissect your previous question, uh, Dr. Curie, uh, because I've, I've worked in Hollywood, and I've, I should say I survived working in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, we've done all kinds of, of manner of productions from uh, TV, film, and even documentaries. And uh, a lot of the, the stories you shared are absolutely right, where it's, because uh, I've also been not only on the behind the camera, but in front of the camera. And a lot of documentaries seem to be picking up these bad habits from uh, reality TV. Yeah. And we've, we've had people interviewed where they're interviewed with a specific answer. And then they see their end product afterwards on TV. And the editor is actually able to cut apart their answer, and it makes them kind of sound like they're saying something completely different or out of context. Or in one recent case with a, a dinosaur special that came out earlier this year, uh, somebody was actually physically in the middle of answering a question, and they just dubbed a voiceover right over his question. <laughs> we <laughs> like see that now. <laughs> I was like, what? well, why ask the guy the question, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. So, yeah, no, we, we have a lot of uh, horror stories from the, the documentary side of things. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, I, I think what you're, you're proposing is very interesting to have the film crews there, at least for some kind of time, while they're going through the, uh, the paleontology process. Mm -hmm. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because um, we don't always know either exactly what the uh, intent of the film is. 
and uh, exactly what they want to get out of it. Because, of course, uh, in most cases, they're not filming just you. You're just part of uh, the documentary, and they'll travel around and uh, film Jack Horner in Montana and then move down to uh, Utah or wherever, and, you know, you're just a little bit of the picture, right? And in many cases, you end up with films that are done worldwide. Um, so uh, you have no idea of exactly how your uh, role fits in the overall picture of the film, number one, and secondly, how it's going to turn out. And the worst case uh, I had was uh, where a group came in to film us. It turned out they were creationists and they were doing a film for a creation science museum. Oh. And we were never <laughs> informed of this. Um, and of course, uh, when I heard uh, that this had been done, I was absolutely horrified <laughs> because I didn't know how uh, you know the film would be edited and uh, what it would make me say in the long run and so on. Uh, luckily, they they had some scruples in the end. <laughs> and, uh, um, although I would say they uh, they only took certain answers that I I gave. Uh, and included them in the film. So there was a little bit of a bias there, um, or appeared to be a bias in, in what I was saying. Uh, the reality was they didn't actually take my sentences and break them up and drop words and things like that, which they could have done, uh, because that it's possible. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, still, it was a very scary experience for me waiting for that damn film to come out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I think what I'm taking out of this is that there's a creationist documentary that has scruples. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> semi scruples so, anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, that's something to look for because I want to see this scruple uh, creationist documentary. <laughs> so that's cool. That's nice to know that that exists. Um, okay, so ba back to the rapid fire questions. Um, what is your take on the recent reworking on uh, Trudon? Well, you know, the big problem with Trudon and Trudontons in general is that as far as North American is concerned, we don't have very many specimens that are um, all that complete. We're dealing with bits and pieces and, uh, and so on. I, uh, I do agree that uh, uh, there's more going on there than meets the eye. It's not all Truodon Formosus. I mean, uh, it has a huge geographic area. It also has a huge time range. And what we're seeing now with the distribution of uh, hadrosaurs, ceratopsians, ankylosaurs, tyrannosaurs, and so on, is that those, uh, none of those species seem to last all, all that long. And uh, so we can expect that there would be a turnover and the things that have been identified as Trudon in the past uh, almost certainly represent more than one species. Now, whether or not it's more than one genus, uh, whether or not uh, um, you can actually tease that out based on the small amount of material we have, that's probably the question that's open. I mean, we unquestionably we need more material we need more stuff being recovered we need more complete material and um, it's going to change the story in the future um, I think in some cases the names that are have been proposed now for for new troodontids um, they may be 100% valid and, and withstand the uh, test of better specimens uh, or they may fall or they may fall a level uh, from different <laughs> genera down to different species. Um, it's one of the intriguing things. Uh, the good thing about it, I would say though, is, is that uh, it does recognize the fact that there is greater variability there than we recognized previously. Something is going on. We can pinpoint characters that are different in say the lower Campanian and the upper Campanian Troodontids. Um, you know, uh, when you're talking about uh, evolution though and transition from one form to another, um, in some cases it's a matter of um, preference, we'll say, as to where you divide uh, one species from another species or one genus from another genus. Um, and uh, there are bone beds down in Montana that uh, have tremendous amounts of troodontid material. 
Um, I would say that uh, if we could double, triple, or quadruple the amount of troodontid material that's come out of those bone beds, we may have a much better sense for how much variability there is in a single population and therefore have an estimate of what's going on in a single species and therefore be able to say something about the generic uh, cutoff points uh, when we're dealing with troodontids and other carnivorous dinosaurs. Uh, we're working on Sornithalestes now. We, we collected a beautiful skeleton here in Alberta a couple of years ago, back in uh, 2014. And uh, the interesting thing is that although we've never had a complete skeleton of Sornithalestes before, we have had a lot of isolated bones. And uh, the interesting thing is that the most variable bones, when you look at them, uh, things like the shape of the maxilla or the, the frontal bones on top of the head and so on, uh, in fact, they are very, very consistent with each other, the specimens. And uh, what that suggests is that these animals uh, weren't all that variable um, within not just the population, but within the formation itself. And uh, we certainly see more variability than that in the troodontids. Um, but again, they're representing a greater period of time and a much wider geographic area. Cool. Yeah, no, that sounds really interesting. And um, uh, are, are you planning on releasing a, an abstract on uh, the uh, the new dinosaur that you guys just, the one you just mentioned? Uh, we've had at least one abstract, which was last year at uh, the Society of River Paleontology meetings. Oh, Actually, okay. it wasn't last year. It was two years ago. Um, so uh, there's that. Uh, but the first paper on it, we're hoping to finish in the next couple of months. And uh, there'll be at least two more papers coming out on it, if not more. It's a beautiful. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. For me, I, I'm one of the the dying generation that loves to read, so it's always exciting when uh, you you hear about a new abstract that's coming out. <laughs> <laughs> so, all righty, uh, back to you, Arson. All right, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, let's take a look here. Um, well, uh, this is the question that is not actually my own. Uh, that was, I believe, that came from one of our friends as well. It could have been Jeffrey, it could have been uh, someone else. Uh, Josh will be able to correct once I read it out, in case I'm wrong. Uh, so uh, the first part of the question is, what are the odds we'll get more material out of British Columbia and Western Laramedia in general? And the second part is uh, whether or not you know about the uh, putative Dasplitosaurus maxilla from that area. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rich McRae, of course, is the guy doing most of the work up in uh, that area of British Columbia. It's, it's a pretty amazing place, and I would say that uh, Rich and Lisa and all their crew have done some amazing things. Um, you know, they, they believe that the material's there, they went out and they found it, they've proven that it's, um, um, it should be there anyway, we, we've known that for a long time, there's, there's nothing to stop the beds from going across the border, and uh, for them to find skeletons. Um, so uh, that's happening now because they believed in it and they went out and they did it. Um, the, uh, the maxilla is a, a very pretty one. Um, it's uh, uh, mostly impression, uh, unfortunately, because uh, that's just the way it was found. Uh, but uh, it's uh, definitely uh, got lots of good anatomical features on it. We can do comparisons with the Tyrannosaur material here in Alberta. And uh, what it does more than anything else is it shows that uh, it's a new area that uh, in the future, now that we know there's stuff there, people are going to spend more time looking for that kind of material and they're going to find it. Um, the same thing goes for uh, northern Alberta. Uh, not that far from where Rich is in Tumbler Ridge. We have Grand Prairie. We have a number of bone beds up there. And um, now we've got skeletons as well. And uh, we even have mummified dinosaurs um, what? and lots of footprints. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of very cool things happening right now. But it's the same story. It's a, it's a matter of uh, everything said that the material should be there. Nobody had found it because, uh, in part, nobody was looking for it. 
Um, once you start making a couple of good finds, then you end up with uh, people focusing more on, on the, uh, the potential that there is resources in the area. And if you focus more on it, you are going to find more, period. And so uh, there's a whole bunch of material that's coming out of northern Alberta now, uh, right next to northern BC, where Rich is working. And, uh, um, you know, it's, it's pretty neat because this is uh, geographically an area that's, uh, say, between Dinosaur Provincial Park and what's going on up in Alaska now. And uh, in terms of time, uh, some of the time represented in the Grand Prairie area is, in fact, uh, a time period when the southern part of Alberta was under the Bear Paw Sea. So we're not seeing what goes on on land. So we're getting some missing gaps in time as well. And um, every year now, new, new stuff is being find up, found up in those regions. And uh, again, it's because of the fact that it's a long, slow process of starting. But once it's started and starts moving, it just starts to get it. Uh, uh, it's like a snowball uh, rolling down a hill. It picks up gravity and momentum. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's very interesting indeed. <laughs> so, um, in any case, uh, Josh, uh, would you like to take over with your question? Yeah, uh, really fast. Uh, so, are you able to hint or um, disclose any information? Because I, I, I hear dinosaur mummies, and that's that's my thing. <laughs> 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 like, what what are we talking about exactly? Dinosaur witch? Uh, mummies. Oh yeah, no. It, the specimen actually got published a few years ago. Um, it's uh, it's on an Edmontosaurus, uh, which had skin impression on its head, and of course we have mummified Edmontosaurus before from Wyoming and uh, the Dakotas and Montana and up into Alberta, but uh, not of the head. And uh, the interesting thing was that uh, the skin that covered the head on this animal shows the presence of a fleshy crest, uh, which is not what we expected to see at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so just to clarify, that, that, was, that was the, uh, the specimen that was preserved with the supposed like display, uh, the fleshy, uh, like you said, crest, that was a display structure or something of that nature? Yes, exactly, and uh, uh, you know, we have uh, many blocks for that specimen. Unfortunately, we do not have the front of the skull and we do not have a lot of the back of the body. Uh, but if we'd been able to collect the whole thing, it would have been probably mummified everywhere. Wow. Wow. Crazy, man. Oh, that's great that it's found. I'm, I'm happy to, that that was found, at least. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, rapid fire question number, I think we're on four, and I think we're on the home stretch. Um, what, if anything more, can you tell us about a paddoraptor? Well, a paddoraptor is, uh, again, a case where, um, you know, you have uh, incomplete material, and we would love to have more, uh, but uh, there was enough of the material there to show that there is significant variation from the other Canignathan material that we have in Alberta. And uh, again, do you uh, classify it as a different species, or do you uh, classify it as a different genus when you don't really know what the variability is expected in any one species uh, of that kind of animal? Um, so uh, there is new specimens being found every year pretty much in the uh, Dinosaur Park and Drumheller regions. Because of that, I had, there's a very good chance that eventually we are going to turn up a, a much more complete specimen and we'll have a much better understanding of it. Uh, you know, it's it, conceivable that a pateraptor may turn out to be just a different species uh, from the Canignathan material we have down in Dinosaur Provincial Park, but it's at least a different species. And uh, to be conservative about it these days, uh, giving it a different genus name makes more sense. Okay, cool. All right, so so again, it's just one of those cases where we don't have enough of it to really say more, <laughs> no. but we need, but we need to dig more. <laughs> no, we need to dig a lot more, and we need to find more specimens. the The key thing is that this stuff gets described because there's no question it shows the presence of Canignathids in that region. 
Uh, it also shows uh, some interesting characters that we didn't recognize for Kane Ignathans before, and it shows that this is not the same Kane Ignathan we have in Dinosaur Provincial Park. Um, so all those things are cool, uh, but we would, of course, love to have a whole skeleton and a whole skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that's the dream. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all righty. Uh, back to you, Arson. Uh, well, uh, looking just at the question list, we've got only like a few let literally left. In fact, two from the list that I'm just kind of going through. So what we can do, uh, perhaps, <laughs> is uh, maybe just uh, I could say, actually, uh, since obviously uh, Josh has uh, worked in the field as well, uh, and uh, obviously ask both of you uh, to, uh, to answer before I obviously make the final uh, sort of note on this whole thing is what would be your advice um, uh, to give to young paleontologists uh, who are just basically still greens, quote unquote. Uh, so, wh who wants to answer first? So feel feel free to go. <laughs> I'll I'll defer to uh, Dr. Curie. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know my own story. I think I told, but uh, it was a matter of being interested when I was six years old in dinosaurs and then reading a book when I was uh, 12 that or 11 that uh, made me decide that I was going to be a dinosaur paleontologist in Alberta. And um, the, uh, the thing was that uh, I went through life thinking I was a normal person and it was only when I had kids of my own that I realized that I probably wasn't normal and uh, developing an interest at such a young age, deciding what I was going to do, and then actually doing it. Um, I think the key thing, though, is is the fact that uh, uh, my chances of succeeding were really pretty limited. <laughs> uh, when I was a kid, uh, you know, there was uh, only a half dozen people in the entire world who were paid to do research on dinosaurs. And uh, so what are my chances of getting a job when there's half a dozen in the world? And uh, um, it didn't seem very good, but the thing was that uh, I knew what my, I was passionate about. And uh, I had decided that um, even if I ended up teaching uh, biology or geology in a community college, and I lived in the place I wanted to live, Alberta, uh, where I could go out and collect dinosaurs and maybe do something on my own time, then it was it was fine. You know, uh, I didn't really expect I was going to get a high paying job. I didn't expect that I was going to get a job where I would uh, definitely be working on dinosaurs and being paid to work on dinosaurs. Uh, I just didn't have those expectations. But I definitely had the interest in doing it and uh, continuing in my quest, regardless of whether there was a job there or not. And uh, I think my advice would just be that um, to anybody, whether it's dinosaurs or whales or whatever you want to work on, if you really want to do it, you just go out there and, and you do what you can and uh, be realistic about it. Uh, maybe you won't do it quite the way you think you're going to do it. Uh, but at least it'll become part of your life at some stage. And that's as important as actually getting a job and doing it full time. Uh, because, of course, once you get a full time job, uh, start working on dinosaurs, then you realize that, uh, wow, there's a lot of administration associated with this job, too. <laughs> and it's like any other job in a way. I teach, I, I uh, give talks, public talks, I, I answer billions of emails, I, uh, you know, I do all the things that everybody else does in their job. Uh, but part of the year I'm out in the field and I'm doing exactly what I want to do, uh, finding dinosaurs, and part of my winter I'm working inside doing research on dinosaurs. Life is cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we can take away. Life is cool. <laughs> 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 nice. Um, yeah, no, I'd say, um, yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Curie is absolutely right. There, There is more than one avenue uh, to get into paleo. Um, and a lot of it is through the sciences. And, I, and even when we talk to people in our chat, because we have a lot of young guys in there, they ask us, you know, what should I start reading? And I, I, I tell them, 
the basics, you know, like the, a lot of these guys would benefit a lot from just a basic course in like biology or uh, evolutionary biology or, uh, you know, just the core basics of what makes, you know, an animal an animal and learning cladistics and bracketing and all these, you know, building block things. Um, and then the second part I'd say is you're going to find out if you're one of two people very quickly in paleontology, if you're a digger or if you're a researcher. <laughs> and um, I, I personally am a digger. I love going out there. I love roughing it. I love digging uh, something out of the earth and being the first person to touch it in 10,000 years or a million years or tens of millions of years. Um, and, and it's a thrill for me. It's, it's like the most primitive but the most exhilarating form of time travel that we have disposed to us currently. Um, and then there's people that hate hiking. And that's cool. <laughs> yeah. That's why I say we have those as researchers, and we have a lot of great researchers in, in the department as well. And I've been doing more of the researching uh, aspect of it as we've been doing the chart project, so this Tyrannosaurus skin chart. And we just finished the Stegosaurus skin chart, and I think we're working on um, trying to get another theropod skin chart out there. We're, we're trying to... Uh, Again, we're researching to see what our options are for the animals with the most skin uh, published because we're actually looking for abstracts and paleontologists to review our work, which is key and what sets our stuff apart from anything else. But it's that research aspect that's just as viable as being the guy going out and digging stuff up. But, I mean, I'm a digger. Uh, Dr. Curie is a digger. I'm biased. I want to say diggers are more cool. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but we're both just as important in the field of paleo. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there's so many things you can do. Exactly is what you say. Um, you know, we have uh, people who are specialists now in paleo art, for example, and uh, they may not have had the scientific bent, but they had the interest in dinosaurs, and they end up becoming specialized in doing artwork for paleontology. We have people who are collections managers who work on dinosaurs. And uh, they didn't uh, have the inclination to go ahead and uh, take a PhD and do research, but they're still working on dinosaurs. They're just doing it in the collections uh, uh, facility. We have people who, of course, make movies about dinosaurs or comic books about dinosaurs or anything else. Um, just because you don't have an inclination in one way doesn't mean you can't get into the field where you're working on what you're left to work on. Yeah, and, um, and and Dr. Curry, let me know if you've actually started utilizing this in your guys' facility too, but like a brand new field that's popped up has been uh, 3D scanning and modeling. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Meredith Riven, who works at the Burke, uh, she's a part of like a huge 3D scanning project that they're scanning complete fossils, uh, not only to uh, piece together mounts, uh, so they're not... Um, they're not kind of patchworking it from a chimera, but they're just 3D scanning the existing elements and then mapping the elements to complete a skeleton. Uh, but they're also scanning complete fossils that they have as part of like a public access for museums that have a 3D printer and just decide, hey, we want a fossil whale or hey, we want a fossil mammoth. And then they just have the 3D uh, library there to print the actual uh, skeleton now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we don't have all the facilities uh, to, to do the printing, although we do on the university campus. And uh, we've utilized it to a large degree, uh, progressively more over the years. I guess we started this way back in the early 1990s with the CAT scanning and producing models at that time. And uh, I guess one of the first best stories I had was we were working on the little troodontid um, Cynornithoides, and uh, it's one that, uh, uh, you know, about the size of a house cat. And essentially this thing laid down to sleep. It's all curled up and um, it uh, fell asleep and never woke up. And wow. uh, it's a specimen we found in China. Uh, we brought it back here. We had a cat scanned and uh, then we had it 3D printed. Uh, at that time, 3D printing wasn't what it is today. It was a lot more complicated. Um, and didn't produce quite as beautiful a model, but 
uh, when they 3D printed it from the CAT scan data, they didn't know what was up and what was down, and so they 3D printed it uh, with the side up that had not been prepared yet. <laughs> so, so we knew it was on the other side from the 3D print, and this is back in, uh, I don't know, about 1992. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we definitely uh, do more of that these days. Uh, we're moving away from uh, producing casts even of specimens by the traditional methods of mold making with uh, rubber latex or RTV or whatever and uh, going straight into um, modeling the specimens and then 3D printing from, from the uh, computer models. Wow, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. And then a question just uh, popped in my head, um, if you don't mind me asking it real fast. Um, going back to the poaching, the, the poaching epidemic, which is being uh, ish, uh, addressed, but it's still an issue. Uh, do you believe that it would be ideal to, to arm paleontologists or even um, uh, park workers or park rangers with 3D scanners so that way when you guys find a, a specimen at, on a season but you're forced to leave it there in situ, uh, you're able to 3D scan the specimen so God forbid if it does get poached at least there's some kind of data that's, that's not lost uh, because of the poaching epidemic. Yeah, well, scanning is uh, becoming more and more important even in the field, and uh, uh, we are using drones these days as a way of uh, mapping our um, quarry sites, for example, um, or in Mongolia to produce topographic maps to uh, label as to where our dinosaur specimens are being recovered from, both um, in terms of uh, uh, X and Y axis, but also in terms of altitude in, in the Badlands and so on. Um, and it's pretty amazing that uh, um, the quality of the images you can get sometimes. Now, the problem is that once we start looking at uh, the details, um, if we're looking at a big bone bed, for example, it's okay. You can see that there are bones there and so on. But uh, very often the rock and the bone is almost the same color and or it hasn't been um, prepared out far enough so that you can see what the, where the edges are. And so sometimes the images just don't work very well. And uh, so sometimes still we have to rely on the traditional method of laying the grid on the ground and then uh, doing uh, an outline map essentially of the bones and, and where they sit. But uh, things are getting better, and um, of course, uh, uh, the sky's the limit in terms of doing this kind of thing. And so the better equipped we are in the field and the more data we collect in the field, um, the better it is in terms of trying to figure out uh, what's been lost to science uh, by poachers or even natural erosion for that matter. <laughs> Okay, cool. So yeah, technology is our friend. I, I love it all. Um, I think um, I think we're close to wrapping, right, Arson? Uh, yes, unfortunately, uh, this is where we ran out of all the questions, technically. And uh, I uh, <laughs> suppose the only last question, and in the traditions of the channel uh, here, uh, this is basically the same thing that Josh went through. That's also the same thing that <laughs> your uh, colleague, Dr. Thomas Carr, went through as well when he was on my channel. It's the question of the century or just generally of life. It's the most, it's, it's even more important than asking, will you marry me? So here is how the question <laughs> goes. Why are dinosaurs awesome? <laughs> because they're big. <laughs> it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> no, I think um, dinosaurs are are awesome because they they give us so many questions they, you know they're interesting animals all by themselves but there's so many questions surrounding them and uh, you know people like mysteries people like solving things people like doing picture puzzles putting things together people like uh, trying to figure out uh, why uh, you know dinosaurs succeeded why dinosaurs went extinct uh, were they intelligent and all these things and uh, so there's so many questions around dinosaurs that keep our minds 
um, active, we'll say. Uh, you know, I often compare myself to being a, a detective. I'm, I'm going into the field, I'm finding a um, uh, crime that happened uh, 75 million years ago, and I'm taking all the evidence that's there and trying to sort out not only, uh, you know, who it was that was killed, but uh, what were the circumstances leading up to the death and who was at fault for this and, uh, um, you know, what else we can learn about uh, the life of that animal um, and uh, try and bring it back to life in a sense. So uh, I think the mystery surrounding uh, dinosaurs and the fact that they are such incredible animals um, and that we know so little about them. I don't think we know 1% of 1% of the species of dinosaurs that existed. There's just an endless amount of work that people can have uh, for all future generations. And uh, it's interesting work. Um, but uh, the real fun for a lot of people, and, and you get this in questions when you do uh, you know, not only interviews like this, but also when you're on the road and you're doing a lecture series or something like that. And you get questions just from the audience, and, and the questions are really perceptive in a lot of cases, but they also indicate what the interests are of the people out there and why they like dinosaurs. And, um, you know, uh, at some point, kids stop asking the uh, the inevitable question, well, who's the biggest, who's the longest, who's the tallest, uh, who was the most ferocious, and so on. And they, they get into the questions of the biology of dinosaurs and whether or not dinosaurs were related to birds and uh, why did these animals have to go extinct, um, you know. Uh, so there's no end to questions about dinosaurs. And... Uh, our ideas evolve as we learn more about them, uh, whether you're a scientist or a six-year-old kid in Mississippi, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, there's always an endless amount you can learn about dinosaurs, and uh, because people are working on it, it just makes it so much more fascinating, uh, because any question you answer raises 10 more. Yeah, that's um, that. That makes perfect sense, and I think that's just also uh, like if we had maybe like a day worth of session, we could talk all day about why dinosaurs are really awesome. So, uh, exactly. I mean, uh, well, uh, you know, asking someone to marry you, it's like it's five seconds, basically, yes or no, or bye bye, <laughs> basically. Like, <laughs> yeah. Then you live with it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you either love it or you live with it, basically. <laughs> you know, one of those things. <laughs> But uh, uh, yeah, in any case, I mean, uh, this is indeed very interesting. I recall, actually, I will quote also once again your uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Thomas Carr, and uh, how he answered the question. His answers are, tend to be very short. He just really doesn't seem to give a lot of long answers, but it was very interesting. So uh, he said the dinosaurs are awesome because they put us in our place. Which I don't know. Do you find? Do you think that's a very good answer to kind of summarize, uh, perhaps, of how truly amazing these creatures really were, and in comparison, how uh, how many periods of time you know uh, have they taken up in the global time scale of uh, life and history, history of the planet Earth compared to humans? So there are certainly things we can learn from them. Unfortunately, if we were, we are not able to summon ghosts of dinosaurs and uh, my viewers probably are just as disappointed to hear that as i am saying it out loud so we cannot yes. ask them you know any specific dinosaur like t-rex uh, you know what do you look like can you trace your ancestry can you tell us why did you disappear you know stuff like that so <laughs> if one if only if only <laughs> by, by the yeah. way uh, di dinosaur ghostbusters i want to say that's the plot to jurassic world 3 uh, so yeah, no, hold on your seats for that. <laughs> no, 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 not Jurassic World three. That will be Jurassic World four because Jurassic oh, World yeah, three, yeah. Jurassic World three is the insurance claim. Remember, that's the one that's, oh, uh, that's right. insurance claim. Yeah. <laughs> after um, they destroy yeah, everything. So. Yeah. <laughs> so no, it's funny, Doctor Carr, that you said that we're like detectives, which I agree because right here, I don't know if you can see it. Um, I have a first edition Sherlock Holmes because uh, detective stories are my favorite. So not to say that we're like Robert Downey Jr., but for the record, uh, Dr. Curie and I are like Robert Downey Jr., if you want to take that away from this interview. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, of course, um, 
Arthur Conan Doyle wrote one of the first prehistoric novels with The Lost World. Of course, it's an yes. iconic piece, yes. And so many yeah. adapt adaptations of it followed thereafter, and uh, they are probably going to keep following eventually after a couple of years afterwards, I think. I think this is one of those things that's going to stay in demand for quite a while. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> right. So, really fast, um, we have a few minutes left. Uh, you mentioned an organization in the first part of the interview. Um, I wanted to give you a time, uh, a bit of moment to plug that organization. Um, it was uh, something to do with uh, your students or, or something of that nature. Uh, do you want to plug that real fast? So uh, was it the Dinosaur Research Institute? Yeah, I think that was it. Yeah. Yeah, Dinosaur Research Institute is something we set up uh, in Calgary, Alberta, uh, basically as a way of um, funding things that uh, we couldn't get at the Terrell Museum uh, because of limits in government funding. So it was a way for oil companies, for example, to make a donation to fund a quarry operation in southern Alberta uh, if funds weren't available because of government cutbacks or whatever. So that's how it started off, and that was uh, 30 years ago. Wow. And uh, this stage, though, um, places like the Terrell Museum are much better funded than they were previously. And uh, the place where we've recognized that funding is more important is, is uh, with students. That uh, if we want to develop future paleontologists, we have to be able to fund not only them, but their research. And so the Dinosaur Research Institute um, basically has transitioned over the years. So now it does fundraising, uh, mostly for supporting graduate students um, in their research. So it's not that it gives them a salary or anything like that, uh, but if they need a few thousand dollars to um, do a CT scan of a particular dinosaur specimen, or a little bit of money to go to a conference in another part of the world, then uh, Dinosaur Research Institute supplies that, those kinds of things. And uh, it's surprising just how a small amount of money can in fact go a long way. Uh, I think one of the reasons we're in such good shape today as a study group, i.e. paleontologists specializing in dinosaurs, is because of the fact that uh, Spielberg and Amblin, they set up the Jurassic Institute, and um, fundamentally that gave small grants to students and researchers worldwide. So it's only a couple of thousand dollars in most cases, but uh, I'm willing to bet more than a million dollars has been spent over the years. So the uh, um, seed money has gone a long way, and it's uh, uh, put a lot of uh, students into positions where now that they can support themselves, and they're doing research. And of course, we today have probably more than 150 people employed worldwide to do research on dinosaurs. So we've never had that many people before. And that's just in a space of 30 years. We've basically gone from zero to our uh, best position ever. Wow. Nice. Okay, so is there um, a website for people who want to donate or help promote it in any way? Oh yeah, there's uh, websites for both the Jurassic Institute and for the Dinosaur Research Institute. And uh, okay. definitely worth looking into because they, they do things as well, like uh, special tours to the Badlands and so on that people can get involved in if they want to. So <laughs> Nice. Cool. Yeah, we'll be sure to get those uh, links from you so we could plug those um, in this interview. That's it. That's okay. all I got. <laughs> well, awesome. Sounds good. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, there's lots of useful information as well for the viewers, I'm pretty sure. Um, so in any case, I mean, I believe this is the time we've reached our conclusion. And uh, I want to thank uh, from the bottom of my heart, Dr. and Professor uh, Philip Curry for joining on my uh, channel. I want to absolutely thank, uh, thank my, uh, I mean, I would, I would say friend but, uh, and co-host, but actually I would dare say that out loud like this, that, you know, brother from another mother, Joshua will say, <laughs> uh, for helping out, uh, you know, in the co-host and uh, working out on the scheduling to help me set up this uh, meeting. And also, 
uh, to basically just help to set up the program as well. And uh, I think um, uh, we uh, should do this a lot more often uh, on the channel. I hope Dr. Curry would happily participate once again. What do you reckon, Dr. Curry? <laughs> oh yeah, in the future. Sure. Not this week. <laughs> sure thing, sure thing. So, uh, well, I guess in, in this case, I've been uh, AK Rex and uh, we've had uh, Professor Curie and we've had Joshua will say and guys thanks very much for watching please make sure you leave a like please make sure you post down your comments to let me know what you think also uh, please subscribe to the channel as I am marching on my way to 1000 subscribers and uh, uh, be sure to leave any other maybe follow-up questions that you may have after viewing the session and uh, perhaps we can better prepare another program and when Dr. Curry is ready to return we can have a volume two. So <laughs> and uh, uh, I guess that wraps up the session and thank you very much uh, gentlemen for joining. It was fun. Well thank you and uh, uh, enjoy. <laughs> 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 we will. Bye -bye. We will. <laughs> Thank you again, All sir. Right. Okay. Have a good day, Dr. Curry. I will. <laughs> well, I guess that leaves us, Josh, and this means that it's time to say goodbye to our viewers and uh, part ways. So, uh, I've been AKRX, this was Joshua will say, and we will hopefully see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>